We've been talking about communities, but we're also talking about individuals. We live in community as a church. We are created by God to live in community, but we also individual human beings and have our own individual lives to live. We've been talking about the virtues of having to live in a community as well as the virtues of having to encounter God on your own. How deep you go in God is a decision that you have to make personally. Hallelujah. And your encounter with God uh, helps you to, de be to determine the purpose of God for your life and often the direction for your life. We talk about the power of self-discovery because many of us don't know who we are. Even David did not know who he was and when he came to the kingdom he was already the king and yet the Bible says and David perceived that God had made him the king. He was already the king but it says he perceived that, hang on a minute, you know, I'm the king today. He's already been the king for quite a while, but he, he perceived something. And sometimes you may be at a place where you are and have no idea why you're there. Sometimes you think you know who you are, but you don't know who you are. We talk about Moses when God sent Moses back to Egypt. And Moses asked God a question, who am I? Who am I that you'll send me back? Don't you know who I am? I'm the guy that was born in the ghetto and raised in the palace. I'm the guy who's confused whether his mother is Jew or his mother is, a, is, a, is Egyptian. I'm the guy who have no idea. I tried to do the right thing and ended up killing a man. So Moses, encountered by God, found his mission for life. Paul thought he was a terrorist. And he thought that that was his purpose, is to kill the church. And when God encountered him, he said, he said to the church in Galatia, God in his mercy separated me from my mother's womb and by his grace called me to preach this gospel. He thought he was a terrorist. He did not know he was going to be the greatest apostles in the, in the New Testament, wrote more than half the New Testament, at least in the books that he wrote. And sometimes we don't know really who we are until we encounter God. And some people don't even know God. They say, who is God? So you have people that say, I don't believe in God because he hasn't done anything for me. If God's so powerful, why is the world in a mess? God is not the God of the world, even though he is oversight of everything. Uh, are you okay? There's a God of this world, his name's the devil, and he's a God of this world. And yet we blame God for what's happening in the world. God is trying to fix the world. Uh, are you okay? Say amen. amen. So we talk about that, that in your encounter with God, it will minister to you give you purpose, help you to live a life that is meaningful, but in that also, it blesses the community that raises you. When David became the king, it raised the whole nation. When you become a doctor, it blesses your family and raises the community. When you become a teacher, it'll bless your students and bless your family and bless the community. Whatever happens, but when you encounter God, Every man and woman in the scriptures encountered God personally. Or they were encountered by God. Abraham. The Bible says when God called him, he called him on his own. He was on his own. And yet he became the father of the faithful. The same God today. God can encounter you and change your life. And in that change become a blessing to the community of faith. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Are you okay? Now, one of the things that have come to the fore recently is the COVID and the vaccination. 
A lot of people say, well, God does not want the church separated by vaccination. God has never separated the church. Give God a break and give me a break. Vaccination will never, never, ever, ever, ever separate the church. Never. Who do you think God is? We were not put together by a vaccination. We were not put together by a doctrine. We were put together by the blood of a person whose name is Christ Jesus. And whether you're vaccinated or not vaccinated, it doesn't separate you from the fellowship of another. We just, we just add our own interpretation to that. Listen to what the Bible says. Hallelujah. Endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body. Whether the other half is vaccinated and the other half is not, there is still only one body. Hallelujah. There is one body, one Spirit. You were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God. And no vaccination or whatever will separate the church from each other. We are a fellowship of saints that are put together by the mystery of the, of the love of God and the power of His blood. And nothing, nothing but us will separate ourselves. No vaccination on the face of the planet will separate you from me. Are you okay? Now, some people may like curry. Some people may not like curry. But whether you go to a curry shop and the other one to go to a sushi shop, if you're both Christians, nothing is going to separate you. Whether you never eat curry and the other guy never eats sushi. Give God a break. Wake up. I'm not angry, just trying to... <laughs> uh, are you okay? I've got some great friends. They are seven days Adventists. You know seven days Adventists don't eat pork and they meet on the wrong day of the week. Now if they hear me preach, I say, no, you meet on the wrong day of the week. Whatever day of the week we meet, we are still one body. Some of those people love the Lord. Some of them love God more than we do. But nothing will separate. No doctrine is going to unite us. Doctrine often separates us. But the person of Jesus Christ is the one that unites us and nothing will ever separate us from his love. Neither death, nor life, nor heaven, nor earth, whatever. Hallelujah. We belong to one family. And a church is not necessarily something that you go to. It's a family that you belong to. Whether you're American or Samoan or American Samoan. What do you call a, a, a cowboy Samoan? <coughs> a Samoan who's a cowboy. A Western Samoan. <coughs> what I'm trying to say is this. There's so much talk. People put stuff on Facebook. Da, 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 da. Nothing will ever separate us Hallelujah. from the love of God. We belong to a family and not even death will separate us. It may separate our fellowship for a moment, our connection for a moment. But I wanted to, to hear what Paul said. I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whom the whole family in and there's only one family. The family of God in heaven and earth. It's one family. Whether you're dead and gone to heaven. Uh, uh, um, Grandma Green, Marge Green, Nana Green is in heaven. We are down here, still in the same family. Death does not separate us from the family. If death can't separate us from the family, what makes you think the vaccine will? We are still a community. But we're still individuals that walk privately with God and encounter God privately. Hallelujah. And when you walk with God and encounter God on your own, because God is available to everybody. God has already moved. We are 2,000 years late. 
And everyone has the same opportunity to encounter God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And when you seek for the Lord and encounter God, because there are two things. God can encounter you supernaturally without you ever doing anything. And in a sense, we have been encountered by God. The Bible says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So when you and I were sinning, you were born uh, in 1977, Christ died in A.D. 33. So you are over 2,000 years too late. So in that sense, God has already encountered us. On the other hand, God can still encounter us today. When, like we said, when Paul went to Damascus, God encountered him and he fell off his horse. And when he opened his eyes, he couldn't see. He saw a light that was brighter than the noonday sun blinded him. And God said, uh, what are you doing, Paul? And Paul said, who are you, Lord? <laughs> who are you, Lord? Can God encounter a terrorist? Yes. Can God speak to you when you're not even born again? Yes. There's a guy in our church, beautiful man of God, who was getting drunk in the pub, and a girl walked past, and he, God said to him, that's your wife. And told everybody, That's, that girl's going to be my wife. He's married to the same girl today. They got married. <laughs> Hallelujah. They now got a kid. But God spoke to him when he was drunk. Uh, are you okay? Jesse Duplanty said, I just used to get drunk and got high on drugs. And when I got high, I ran into the most high. <laughs> can God encounter anybody? God can encounter. He's God. The problem with God is he thinks he's God. And he can encounter anybody. So God, in one sense, can encounter you supernaturally. On the other hand, you can encounter him by looking for him, even though he's not lost. It's almost like God invites us, would you dare run after me? In the book of Song of Solomon, the Bible tells us, draw me, draw me, and we will run after thee. But you draw one person, but those that run is not one person. Draw me and we will run after thee. You draw one and the community runs after you. Because when one person encounters God, he encounters God not just for himself, but for the sake of the community. What shall I do? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved and your house, your family. So one encounters God and the crowd follows and when you encounter God and as I said God is available to everybody everyone has the same opportunity to come to know the Lord how deep you get is not up to me it's up to you how deep I go in God is not up to you it's up to me so your personal decision in encountering God is a personal thing it's a personal walk your private walk with God how deep that walk is it's not up to anybody of the community but up to you hallelujah that's where people are separated because a lot of people say God is no respecter of men well that's true halfway God is no respecter of men because everybody has the same opportunity to God but how you take that opportunity then becomes different because 
when you take that opportunity and draw closer to God than anybody else, then God becomes a respecter of men. Talk to John and talk to Jesus. Jesus loved John more than he loved Peter. Whose decision was that? John's. So Peter, being very clever, wanted to ask Jesus, who's going to betray you? But Peter knows he's not that close to Jesus, and if he asked Jesus, Jesus would not tell him. So you know what Peter did? Very clever. He asked John. John asked Jesus. Jesus told John, and John told Peter. So in that sense, God becomes a respecter of men. The Bible says, when I talk to everybody in Israel, I will talk to them in, either in a dream or a prophecy. But when I talk to Moses, I talk to him face to face like a man talks to his friend. So how you talk to God face to face is not my decision. It's not your wife's decision. It's not your pastor's decision. It's not your husband's decision. It's your decision. How close you get to God becomes your decision. So we are a community of saints. But we're also individuals that walk with God. Hallelujah. And when you walk with God, there are certain um, benefits of those that walk close with the Lord. Are you okay? Now let me back up and say something else. God is no respecter of men. God is a respecter of Faith. And everywhere God finds faith, he moves. The only problem is that faith has to be carried by an individual. Faith is not a concept out there. Hey, there's faith. And now faith lives in here. You don't just say, hey, that's faith. No, faith is in a person. And when God finds that in a person, he will move over a million people to touch that person. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Good preaching, Pastor. This is not faith. Faith is in a person. Faith becomes flesh, hallelujah, and dwell among us. And when that happens, it blesses you, but it also blesses the community. Are you okay? So now that everybody's up to date, let's start for the message for this morning. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> you know, Paul said to the church in Galatia, he said, the gospel that I preach was not given to me by the other apostles. It wasn't given to me because I went to church. The gospel that I preach, I receive from him. It was a personal encounter, not just in Damascus, the road to Damascus, but he was taught the gospel by revelation of Christ. Hallelujah. Are you okay? David um, gave me a prophetic word. He wrote it down, but I couldn't find it. I was going to read it to the first service, but I realized I haven't got it. But the essence of the word is this. There are people in the church, and I hope you're not one of them, that come to church, understand certain principles, but you have not got a relationship with God. You understand that regardless of who uses the word, the word will still perform because it's God's word. The most heathen human being that uses the Bible, and there was a, a president of the United States that used the Bible avidly, but he cut out, he created his own Bible, he cut out all the miracles because he didn't believe that they, 
a miracle, could, a supernatural thing could happen. So he, he cut out all the things and everything in the Bible he, he put together but the miracles. I don't know where that president, because he's dead now, I don't know where he's gone to him. I don't know what he, what he did at the end of his life, whether he made his peace with God. But the point is, you can take the Bible, use its principles, and it'll work for you, and still not know God. Hallelujah. So how do you seek God? Because when you seek God, you're not seeking a doctrine, you're not seeking a church, you're seeking a person. Can you have a look at Jeremiah 29? Are you okay? Did you bring your Bible? Jeremiah 29, and this is one of the most popular verses in the Christian church today. And even the little ones, they love this verse. Verse 11. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, Thoughts of peace and not evil to give you a future and a hope. That's my verse. A lot of people can claim that verse and still have no relationship with God. But that's not the verse we're talking about. Uh, verse 12. Then you will call upon me and you go and pray to me and I will listen to you. Now that's an amazing thing that the God of heaven and earth will listen to us. John Wesley said this, God will do nothing on earth except in answer to somebody's prayer. Now that's an amazing thing to say. God will do nothing except in answer to prayer. The late Miles Monroe said this, prayer is earthly permission for heavenly interference. If you want God to interfere with somebody's life or interfere with your life, it comes through prayer. You allow the God of heaven to invade your life. It's given heaven in permission, uh, given heaven permission to interfere or intervene in our lives. I've been praying for the Ukraine that God will intervene. There's so many supernatural things that are happening. Next Sunday, we're going to take up a love offering for the Ukraine. Please come to church and give generously. But don't wait till next Sunday. You can give after church. Hallelujah. And then verse 13 says this, and this is the verse we want to, to take. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. When you search for him with all of your heart. That means your heart can be everywhere. And you need to gather your heart with all of your heart. Not half your heart, not a quarter of your heart, not a third of your heart. But all of your heart, the Bible says, you will find him if you search for him. Now, God's not lost. You are lost. I'm lost, but God's not. But it's like God gives us an invitation to come and find him. And Jesus said, knock, and the door will be open. He said, ask, and it will be given. Seek, and you will not find. I mean, find. Hallelujah. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. For those who come to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of those that diligently seek Him. You want God to reward you? He can reward you, He can bless you, but you have to seek Him even though He's not lost. So how do you encounter God? You seek. You seek the Lord. The Bible says, uh, Seek the Lord while He may be found. Call unto Him while He is near. Let the wicked man forsake his ways, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and to our God, for He will abundantly pardon not just pardon abundantly pardon it says when you seek the lord the bible says call unto me and i will answer thee and i will show thee great and mighty things 
that you don't know. Now that's a very easy verse to memorize. Jeremiah 33, 3. Call unto me, and God promises he will answer. Hallelujah. There's a command, there's a promise, and a surprise. The command is, call unto me. The promise is, I will answer thee. The surprise is, I will show you things you don't know. I'll show you something you don't know. And you don't know everything. Because if you did, we ought to be following you. But really, we'll pray for you because we know you're lying. Because you don't know everything. Mario Morello was speaking, I think it was in Brisbane, to a, a conference about 7,000 people. Or about that amount of people came. And, and he picked out a young man. Out of all these thousands of people, he picked out this young fella. And most of the people that were there knew that he was the son of a pastor. He was backslidden. He came to the meeting to look for a girl. He didn't come to encounter God. And the, the pastor said to him, when your, the meeting is finished, you're going to go to your car. The moment you're going to put your key in the, the car to unlock the car, God will give you an idea of something that you're going to do, and he'll make you a multi-millionaire. You're going to change the course of your life. At the end of the meeting, he went to his car, he went about to, and God gave him an idea about building a particular medical equipment. So he spent a lot of time and, and money to build this thing, and when it was built, the pharmaceutical company wanted to take the thing. That he had to take the pharmaceutical company to the courts, and in the courts, he won the case, and uh, the pharmaceutical company was, was, was told by the judge to pay the young man, it was either 14 or 24 million, one of the, a change to the course of his life. Just one idea from God. He came to look for a girl, and God encountered him. Hallelujah. How do you encounter God? You seek. The Bible says, if you seek, you'll find. If you search for me with all, you're going to find me. Why? Because God's not lost and It's almost like, you'll come and find me. Like hide and seek. But what the Bible says, why do you hide yourself behind the cloud? And as we said more than once in the past, and I'll say it again today, the nature of God is that he hides himself. That's the nature of God. He hides. The Bible says it's God's privilege to hide a matter. It's your and my privilege to go find it out. Peter knew his little friend. Well, I'm saying little because I'm talking about heights, all right? Nobody, Jesus is not little. Peter knew his friend's name was Jesus. Peter knew that. Peter knew his friend's mom had, was pregnant before his friend's mom married his dad. So Peter knew that, knew that he was the son of Mary and the son of Joseph. Peter knew that. Peter knew his friend was a carpenter. Peter knew that. What Peter did not know is that his friend is the son of the living God. That came by revelation. Why? Because God hides himself. Are you okay? God still does the same thing today. And when you seek him, you'll find him. Hallelujah. If God did not hide himself, the whole world would be saved today. But God hides himself. Wants you to go look for him. But he's not lost. You're the one that lost. We are the ones that are lost. Are you okay? Hallelujah. So seek for God with all of your heart. Knock and he will be open. Ask and he will be given. Seek and he shall find. Can't open the door. We are in bed. Can't come. We are in bed. Lend me three loaves for a friend. 
knock 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 on heaven's door I don't even know if that that song is a nice song or not but I'm just saying there was a question I was asking God I was asking God more than one question there was one particular one it has to do with marriage and it had to do with uh, God loving Europeans more than he loves Samoans you <laughs> Uh, my, my questions were very honest because I go to a European church and God will move and I go to a Samoan church and, well, you know. So I was asking God, do you love Europeans more than you love Samoans? And then a lot of people said, oh, Samoans should marry a Samoan. So I was asking God, are you against mixed marriage? So I was asking God honest question. I ended up marrying the United Nations. So that was a great answer. Because my wife's part German, she's part Chinese, and she's part Tongan, and she's heavenly part. The heavenly part is the Samoan part. When you get to heaven, you're going to speak Samoan. You don't believe me. Well, there were these guys. There was a Mexican. There was a, uh, uh, an American. There was a Maori, and there was a Samoan. They were all in one car and they were going down the road and having an argument. The Maori said, God's Maori. The American said, God is an American. The Mexican said, God's a Mexican. And they were so heated in the car that they had a car accident. And all of them died. And all of them end up in heaven and they walk up to the door and here comes Jesus. And you know what he said? Yeah, suma go suma. <laughs> and he spoke Samoan to them and the Samoan said yeah I told you it's Samoan when you get to heaven you're going to speak Samoan if you're, in, if, you, if you're watching on live stream I was just joking to the church okay in heaven you're going to speak Maori and everybody will understand the others will speak Samoan and everybody will understand. Doesn't matter what language you speak, you may speak your native tongue, but everybody will understand. Why? Because knowledge is complete. Hallelujah. And you're going to know as you're known. And the one that gave all languages will allow you to understand all languages. And you're going to understand English even though it's a terrible language you cut down a tree and then you cut it up again how can you cut up a tree when you just cut it down <laughs> you cut it down and then you cut it up give me a break <coughs> why did you cut it down in the first place if you're gonna cut it up hallelujah but you seek the Lord if you're gonna encounter God have to be honest with God. So I ask God these questions and I decided to fast for 21 days. And when you're Samoan, food is very important. It's a very important part of culture in any culture, but especially if you're a Polynesian. You talk to the Maoris and they think a boil up was made in heaven. <laughs> So I fasted 21 days, and after 21 days, God never said anything to me. So I decided to uh, break my fast. Let me say something. If you fast for 21 days, don't break your fast in one day, please. Take about a week or two weeks to break your fast, okay? So after that, I decided uh, I still need an answer, so I, I, I decided to fast another 21 days. So I did, and after 21 days, all I got was very, very hungry. Because God never answered my prayer. And then I broke my fast, and not long after that, I decided to fast again, because I still needed an answer. And I fasted, and on the 19th day of the fast, I knew God was not going to say anything. He hasn't said anything in the last uh, 42 days of fasting, and 19th day, I thought, I better break my fast, I'm hungry. So I decided on the 19th day of the fast to break my fast, and God never answered that prayer. 
you're going to seek God, seek Him diligently with all of your heart. We were in Palmerston North and I was walking down Broadway. My wife, I think, was in a shop and I was just walking. It was cold. It was a winter's day. It was dark. The sun was not shining. It was an overcast day. I was just walking down the road, minding my own business. And it's just like God come behind me and put a jacket over me and said, that's the answer to your prayer. And I've never been the same since. If you seek me, you'll find me, God says. You go and pray to me and I will listen to you, God says. God is a reward of those that diligently seek him. If you're going to encounter God, he had to learn to seek him. And when he kept on knocking and kept on knocking and kept on knocking, I said, I'm in bed with my children. I can't come down now and give you. He said, just lend me three loaves. In the end, the Bible says, he went down and gave him all that he wanted. He came for three, but he gave them all, everything and more. Call unto me, I'll answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things that you don't know. Hallelujah. I'll finish it next week. Because I'm over the limit by three minutes. Just want to say that if you're going to seek God, you need to cultivate an atmosphere that will attract the presence of God. Cultivate an atmosphere where God can't help but turn up. An alcoholic, there's an atmosphere. All he needed is to smell liquor. And he'll find it. God lives in an atmosphere. The Garden of Eden was an atmosphere. The fish lives in an atmosphere. The tree lives in an atmosphere. We talk about that. And God creates an atmosphere first. Before he creates the thing that he puts in the atmosphere even though he creates it out of the atmosphere. If you understand what I'm saying? So he created the sea before he created the fish. But when he created the fish, he spoke to the sea. Because the sea was already created. Sea, bring forth fish. And the fish, the environment is the sea. You take the fish out of the sea, the fish will die. He created the soil and then spoke to the soil, let trees come up. And trees come out, out of the atmosphere of the soil. If you take the tree out of the soil, the tree will die. He created the air, then spoke to the birds. And the birds will fly in the air. If you take the air, the birds will have nowhere to fly. The birds will die. Hallelujah. Then he created Eden, created the, his presence, a place where the presence of God is. And then he created man and put man in Eden, put man in the presence of God. When you take man out of the presence of God, man will die. That's why we're dead. That's why we need God. Because we are outside of the atmosphere of the presence of God. And when you come back to that presence, and you die in that presence, it's an amazing thing. Jesus said, even though you're dead, you're not. I'd rather be dead in that presence than live outside that presence, because you live outside that presence, even though you live, you are dead. But if you die in his presence, even though you're dead, you're alive. So if you're going to attract the presence of God, you're going to attract God, you have to create an atmosphere where God finds a home. And we'll talk about that next week. But today, if you're here today, 
You've never made God the Lord of your life. You've never understood that God loves you. God wants to be invited into your life. That you have to seek him to find him. He's available to you today. If you're here today, you've never made Christ the Lord of your life. What a fantastic day to do that. And if you're listening from home, wherever you are, whether it's overseas or in New Zealand, you want to give your life to Jesus today. It's a fantastic day to do so. Hallelujah. God loves you. God can be found. And God wants to be wants to be your God, your friend, your Savior, your Lord, your King.